pleasure and honor to introduce David Pierce to deliver such a lecture this year. David is a professor of economics at NYU and over the years has made some fundamental contributions to economic theory and in particular to game theory and the theory of repeated games. He has studied strategic behavior in games, reputation, bargaining, information imperfections. David's research has tackled some of the fundamental issues uh, about what economics is and how we frame the problems we study. This work uh, might sound uh, quite ab abstract, but I do believe that this type of work is of great importance to the profession. I think that the axiomatic approach we use, starting from the definition of preferences and equilibria, lie at the foundations of what economists, ranging from applied uh, theorists to empirical economists, do and study. Indeed, one of the main goals of uh, Frisch and the others that founded the Econometric Society had was to unify the study of economics under a framework that would use the insights from mathematics and statistics to model individual behavior and individual interactions. Over the years, David's research has provided some important contribution to this endeavor. I know and have used some of his work on equilibria and their selection in repeated games, and I do think that it's very important. In my address on Monday, I was trying to stress that uh, uh, we, the way we measure things, economics, what we measure and how we measure it, should be inspired by economic theory. And David's work has provided some important input to this, um, um, to this um, approach. Before the lecture, I exchanged a few emails with David about the theme of the lecture and what uh, he will be talking about today. And I was very excited to learn that he will be talking about some new ideas and themes, giving a Bayesian perspective to the analysis of individual and social welfare, uh, trying to relax some of the restrictions that early thinking uh, has imposed uh, on it. Therefore, I'm, leaving, I'm really looking forward to listen to what he's going to say, and uh, I'll uh, give the floor uh, to uh, David now. Thank you, David. Grazie Orazio e benvenuti a tutti all'Università Bocconi. It's a great honor to give the Frisch Memorial Lecture. Ragnar Frisch was uh, one of the really singular figures of 20th century economics. He was the main force behind the founding of the Econometric Society and uh, the founding of Econometrica, which he edited for 23 years. And along with Jan Tinbergen, he was awarded the first Nobel Prize in economics. Uh, Paul Samuelson had to stand in line. Uh, <clears throat> he had an amazing ability to, uh, to conceptualize areas of our discipline and then to give them enduring names. So microeconomics is his name. Macroeconomics is his term. And he also introduced the term econometrics <laughs> to economics. So this is ridiculous. He just uh, imagined and then named our core curriculum. But far more important than that, he was a methodological pioneer. He, he had a profound influence on how we do economics. Frisch wanted economics to adopt the standards of a science, taking physics as an example. He urged quantification using mathematics and statistics emphasizing the interplay of theorizing and empirical work. I think the um, early inspiration for this was a visit by Albert Einstein to the University of Oslo. Uh, he gave uh, public lectures there on recent advances in physics, which Einstein knew a thing or two about. And um, uh, young Frisch attended that and he was quite stunned by the, uh, the, uh, the brilliance of the, the theoretical imagination and the ingenuity of, of the empirical testing of the hypotheses. So uh, if it were not for that visit by Einstein, there might have been no econometric society and uh, we might not be having a world congress right now. A great deal of uh, very fine uh, history of thought work was done by Olaf Berkholdt on Ragnar Frisch. So I wrote to him last year, Bierkolt, and uh, asked him a whole lot of questions after reading some of Bierkolt's uh, 
History of Thought work, and I got uh, very enthusiastic, helpful answers. And um, at some point, the answers didn't come anymore, and I was dismayed to find that he had passed away this February. Uh, it was really saddened to, uh, to lose this new academic friend. Since that time, we have lost too many brilliant and beloved members of our community, and uh, they are very much uh, in our thoughts just now. Uh, Berkholt uh, emphasized that within the, the uh, ambitious scientist uh, that was Ragnar Frisch, there was an intense uh, empathic humanist. Um, and I give you one quote here from Berkholt. Uh, that just makes me admire Frisch all the more uh, for his concern for all of humanity. Through his writings and especially through the, the societies that he founded, Frisch had an enormous influence. Uh, but one of his caveats has not had as much attention as I think it deserved. Uh, he said in print in 1926, the methods of natural science cannot unreflectively be copied for use in economics. This lecture will focus on what I consider to be the unreflective and harmful application of ideas popular among philosophers of science in the 1920s to individual welfare and social welfare. The logical positivists, such as Schlick, uh, Carnap, Reichenbach, Karl Hempel, and so on, developed the idea that only statements verifiable through direct observation or logical proof are meaningful. While this seems to have influenced many economic writers, including Lionel Robbins, it is given stark expression by Paul Samuelson in the foundations. It is clear that every assumption either places restrictions on our empirical data or is meaningless. Here Samuelson is speaking of consumer theory, but he makes it plain elsewhere that he believes nothing is added to welfare economics either by going beyond ordinal information about individual tastes. So I give you the earliest reference that I could find there, but I'll give you a slightly colorful um, <clears throat> backup support for, for what I've just said. Um, there was a famous spoof of British history called 1066 and all that. So when the distinguished uh, British economist, Dennis Robertson was trying to persuade the, the profession to take a more broad view of utility theory, he wrote an essay and entitled it Utility and All That. Uh, in the early 60s, when Robertson passed away, um, <clears throat> Samuelson was eulogizing him. And apart from the praise that he heaped on the economic analysis, he was emphasizing the, um, the eloquence of, of Robertson in his writing and also his persuasive powers. So Samuelson says, the man could almost make you believe in such absurd things as cardinal utility. So we know where Samuelson stood on uh, utility and all that. One could argue indefinitely about what generates admissible data, uh, which one would <clears throat> then uh, use to apply Samuelson's criterion. But it's plain from their writing that Arrow and Samuelson both had fairly severe standards in this regard basically viewing a preference ordering as the most one could elicit from an individual. If we take Samuelson's criterion literally, and we have an experimental subject in front of us, the question, does this subject have thoughts and feelings, or is it insentient and simply programmed to simulate human behavior? That question must be considered meaningless. Anything referring to subjective states, thoughts, feelings, uh, is meaningless by, by a strict positive positivist criterion. To me, a satisfying welfare economics must involve the quality of human experience. In contrast, the welfare economics that considers thoughts and feelings meaningless is like Seinfeld, a show about nothing. So long ago in uh, my by far worst received paper, uh, I tried to express this with greater solemnity. When one speaks of welfare economics and social choice, human perceptions and feelings are of the essence. Without them, it's not clear what's being discussed. To trim experience from a model of social welfare in the name of Occam's razor is to kill the subject by cutting out its heart. That's what I felt then, and that's what I feel now. Okay, so uh, kind of brutalist application of, um, 
of positivism uh, really leads to solipsism. Solipsism is the concern that um, nothing outside of one's own mind exists or that it would be meaningless to claim that it existed. Uh, Descartes was, was concerned with that for some time and struggled with it and consoled himself famously by, by saying that I know I exist, I think, therefore I am. Uh, <clears throat> the whole issue is sometimes called uh, Cartesian anxiety by philosophers. Solipsism itself is a, a Latin word, but inevitably one finds upon investigation that the uh, Roman philosophers borrowed the idea from the Greeks who called it uh, autokratia. Um, <clears throat> forward slide, okay. So it was first apparently written about, as far as we know, by uh, an early sophist called uh, Yorgias. Um, he wrote a tract entitled On Non-Existence. Fittingly, it doesn't exist because it's been lost, but it was not lost before Roman times. So Roman philosophers uh, studied it, debated it, and particularly it was uh, it won great admiration from uh, the skeptic philosopher Sextus Empiricus. Now, in passing, I have to say, I love the idea that a skeptic philosopher who presumably needs to be shown the data uh, is called Sextus Empiricus. But thanks to him, uh, we can summarize the three uh, central tenets of on non-existence as follows. First, nothing exists. Secondly, if it did, you wouldn't know. And finally, if you happen to know, you couldn't communicate it. Okay, so suppose Arrow and Samuelson had been ancient Greek philosophers. So imagine with me them arriving at some intellectually curious ancient Greek village and the crowd gathers. And on their way into town, the, the two of them had been discussing how you might elicit a preference ordering from an individual. So they tell the crowd about that, as one does. And this elicits uh, quite a bit of, of interest. Um, <clears throat> so, sorry. Uh, the, the crowd wants to know um, about further information beyond the preference ordering. So Arrow and Samuelson say, first, it doesn't exist. Secondly, if it did, you couldn't access it. And finally, if you happen to access it, you would find it meaningless. Okay. Obviously, I'm having some fun here. There's something about this tertiary template for nihilism that appeals to me. But let's get serious and give Professor Arrow a chance to answer exactly that question about the further information himself. This is in print, uh, JPE, 1950. It is further assumed that utility is not measurable in any sense relevant to welfare economics, so that the tastes of an individual are completely described by a suitable preference pattern or indifference map. So for most of us who've had a, a neoclassical training, this is an unremarkable statement. We've seen statements like this a thousand times, but to me, I still can't get my head around it. It just makes no sense to me. Um, so let me give you an example of, of why. Okay, so I've been put in charge of making a social choice allocation. The people involved are five kindergarten children, five five-year-olds, and there are two possible allocations, X or Y. So uh, the children have been polled on their preferences. The first four of the five all say they strictly prefer X to Y. The fifth strictly prefers Y to X. Okay, so I say to myself, I, it's too bad it's not unanimous, but it's a very strict uh, supermajority. Four out of five strictly prefer Y to X. So let's say I'll rank strictly X strictly above Y as well. Now the messenger who told me all this says, um, you're probably not interested in this, but um, the first four children prefer X um, <clears throat> in which they each get to choose 1,001 toys as opposed to under Y where they get to choose only 1,000 toys. The fifth child has a fatal illness. Under X, she will die a long terrifying death. Under Y, she will be treated and be fine. So, I'm going to be falling over myself to try to change my submitted ranking from X over Y to Y over X. I want to save the child's life. And I'm not too interested in whether the kids get a thousand and first toy each. Okay, so I care about a lot more than the strict ordering. I want to know more about uh, how the 
the respective individuals' welfares will be affected by the, the two allocations. Um, <clears throat> so notice a couple of things. First, the new information does not tell us everything we might like to know. For example, it might be the case that the fifth child is so deeply depressive that she scarcely prefers life to death. Okay, so that might be true, but probably not. <laughs> okay, social choice, like most choice in life, is about guessing. We would like those guesses to be as intelligent as possible. So the word Bayesian in the title of my talk, I don't want it to be uh, strictly interpreted. There's lots of room for bounded rationality here. So neo-Bayesian, quasi-Bayesian, post-Bayesian would be fine with me. But um, <clears throat> when we don't know something, we're going to gather as much as inform information as we can and then, then form a prior. Okay, and just, uh, just try to make an intelligent guess. Okay, secondly, the example has only two so social alternatives. So there are no Condorcet cycles. And independence of irrelevant alternatives has no bite. It's vacuously satisfied when there are only two alternatives. So in other words, my problems with neoclassical utility and welfare theory begin long before Arrow's theorem. You would be, uh, it would be a fair objection on your part to say, David, you're cheating with that example. You're supposed to be giving us more utility information, but in fact, you gave us more information about the alternatives and it was observable uh, information. So somehow the example is not quite to the point. So I plead guilty um, as charged. But one could go back and make up a more clumsy example where the example begins the same way, but now the extra information I'm given is that, oh, when we pulled the first four kids, they didn't seem very interested. They said, oh, I guess, yeah, X probably better than Y. Can we go back and play now? Whereas the fifth one was incredibly intense. She said, oh, Y would be okay, but if X were to happen, I would be sent into such a deep and, and, and lasting depression that I, I, I might never escape it. Okay, what would I say then? Well, first, I'd say that's quite a mouthful for a five-year-old. But secondly, I would say, it's not clear to me that X is worth it, even though the majority is with X. They don't seem to care very much and it seems to be a desperate matter for the fifth child. So I'd probably prefer Y to X. Um, <clears throat> Okay, so I've made it clear that um, there's a lot more I would like to know for cho social choice purposes than just preference orderings. Um, but sometimes a preference ordering is, profile is going to be about all that's uh, available. So let's stipulate that there are certainly important classes of problems where basically all you're going to get is a preference profile. So this is the province of Arrows and Possibility Theorem. So let's spend uh, some time with that. Um, <clears throat> so some basic notation, uh, you've all seen this before, and citizens and finite, a set of possible social allocations A, let's say that's finite as well, and at least three elements. So an Arovian social choice function, I'll call it social choice rather than social welfare function, just to distinguish it from the Bergson Samuelson social welfare function, more of which in a little while. So an SEF maps preference profiles over A into a social ranking of A. Some think of this SEF as a voting rule. I don't, as Arrow explicitly rules out any strategic behavior. So I just think if preferences were known, an SEF would be a way of aggregating them. Arrow proposes for conditions that he thinks any SEF should satisfy, universal domain, Pareto principle, non-dictatorship, and IIA. So the independence of irrelevant alternatives is the most subtle of these. It says that uh, the social ranking of any pair X and Y depends only on individual rankings of X against Y, not X or Y against anything else. Okay, so strict local information uh, of a binary nature. And the famous impossibility theorem is that uh, there is no social choice function satisfying all four of those axioms. This is one of the most famous results of the 20th century, and it sent shockwaves through economics and eventually political science and political philosophy. Often described as disturbing and troubling, the theorem was considered a paradox and even a challenge to democracy. Much of this was in line with Arrow's own views, but more than that, he asserted early 
in 1950 and often that his theorem also showed the impossibility of a Bergson-Samuelson social welfare function. Quote, hence the possibility theorem is applicable here. We cannot construct a Bergson social welfare function. Talk about throwing down the gauntlet. So Samuelson was very unhappy. He argued passionately against this, but um, many, many people were convinced by Arrow nonetheless. There ensued decades of discussion about whether Arrow's theorem had, quote, killed welfare economics, close quote. So there are a couple of excellent papers on this subject. Um, recently, Erad Igersheim and uh, earlier Florbay and Mongin in 2005. Philippe Mongin repose en paix. Arrow reviews his axioms and concludes that as he feels he can't do without PD or IIA, it's going to be necessary to explore restricted domains. An extensive literature resulted, and for example, there's a very good uh, survey that I, I suggest for you there. But many others question, question the wisdom of imposing IIA. Might ranking information beyond the pair of allocations X and Y not hold clues to the intensity of an individual's preferences over X uh, for X over Y? Okay, there's that suspicious word intensity from a positivist point of view. These questions never made it past the dual guardians of the positivist gate, meaninglessness and immeasurability. Even Amartya Sen sounds apologetic as he tentatively raises the issue. The rationale of positional rules relates to attaching importance to the placing of intermediate alternatives in individual preferences, which can be taken as suggesting that the gap between the two must be, other things given, larger. This argument is not entirely convincing. Many intermediate alternatives can be placed in a small interval, while large intervals may happen to be empty because of the contingent fact that there happens to be no other alternative that fits in just there. On the other hand, if information is thought to be extremely hard to get in social choice, then it is not entirely unreasonable to attach some significance to the fact that the placing of intermediate alternatives might be indicative of something. <laughs> okay, so have you ever heard so many qualifiers? As he writes, Sen can hear those uh, positivist guard dogs howling and snarling and snapping. Okay, so I claim that a decision theoretic approach can give a resounding unqualified affirmative answer to Sen's question, and a question asked in, in different ways and in different intensities by many, many people, including Clifford Hildreth, Lucent Rafa, Rothenberg, Gibbard, and many, many more. To do this with maximal clarity, I adopt one of Arrow's several interpretations of his social choice function. It might reflect the rankings of an external observer or perhaps one of the individuals themselves charged with taking others' rankings into account as well. And there's one of many references there. The discussion in Arrow leaves the impression that a rule or an observer violating IIA is erroneously trying to make interpersonal comparisons where none can be meaningful. I wish to argue that every sympathetic rational observer will find the information that's banned by IAA strictly valuable. Hence, rationality requires not the satisfaction of IAA, but its violation. Okay, so what I'm trying to do is let's not prejudge whether IAA is required by rationality or not. Let's model rationality the way we usually do in classical decision theory. Okay, so so that would be Savage, 1954, or Anscombe Allman, 1963. What would they ask for, ideally? Okay, they might ask for a complete transitive preferences on the part of the observer over a set of acts, mapping states to prizes, and preferably associated probabilistically sophisticated beliefs. Accordingly, my sympathetic external observer is going to be a Bayesian subjectivist in the tradition of Savage, Initially, she knows little about the individual's tastes regarding allocations in A. She doesn't even know how they rank them. So she formulates a state space, cap S, that captures this uncertainty. A particular state represents in the observer's mind one particular resolution of this uncertainty. That is, one possibility regarding what each of the allocations would be like for each of the unmembers of society. For such a state, there are individual preference orderings. We don't have a common name for this symbol. Uh, I always call it clunk, 
and I advise my students not to call it clunk or people will laugh at them. And I advise you the same, don't call it clunk. But I'm gonna call it clunk sub i. So the ith person has complete transitive preferences, clunk sub i. Acknowledging that ex ante any preference profile is possible, the observer has at least one state for each preference profile. Now, if I were the observer, I'd have many states for each preference profile. Once I get told everyone's preferences, I'm gonna think, okay, that tells me a lot, I learned a lot, but there's still a lot I don't know, okay? How does it feel for them to experience any one of these all allocations? It could feel many different ways and that's still consistent with that ranking, okay? However, for simplicity, I'm just going to assume because the observer is never going to receive information any finer than the preference profile information, that um, there are just as many elements of S as there are preference profiles over A. Okay, that's without loss of generality. And if we wanted to do a more complicated treatment, that nothing would change. An act associates with each state an allocation in A, or in that's common element, a lottery over A. The observer's preferences clunk without a subscript on the set of acts are assumed to satisfy clunk is complete and transitive. All states in S are non-null. That's just saying that she regards uh, everything as possible ex ante. And clunk satisfies the anscom almond independence and continuity axioms. So I just want my external observer to be an ideal, rational decision maker. This is enough to yield an additively separable utility representation for the external observer's preferences over acts. It also lets us construct conditional preferences, clunk, uh, given, given row for each preference profile row. So see chapter 10, for example, of Krebs notes on a theory of choice. I'd like the observer to satisfy one more condition, which we could call non-paternalistic sympathy. It's just a Pareto condition. Uh, if all N individuals in society prefer X strictly to Y, then so, does, so do her conditional preferences, the observer. Okay. Um, a couple of remarks. Here we're certainly dealing with state-dependent preferences. The ex ante uncertainty is all about how individuals feel about and rank the allocations in A. But I'm not going to make any adventurous assumptions about, um, about the state dependence. Um, the, I'm not assuming the observer can rank different state allocation pairs. Maybe she thinks she can, maybe not. It's not going to come into our analysis. Similarly, I'm not assuming that she believes that different individuals' utilities are comparable to one another. Maybe she does, maybe she doesn't. Uh, we don't need to specify. Notice that any, sorry, that the observer's preferences induce an Arovian social choice function. So for any preference profile row, her preferences order the allocations in A, okay, her conditional preferences. So the induced SCF satisfies universal domain by the no-null states condition, Pareto efficiency by the non-paternalistic sympathy condition. Now, I just want to make one simplifying assumption, which I'll relax in a minute, okay? So suppose that individuals are numbered randomly before their preferences are reported to the observer. And suppose that she therefore views them symmetrically. Then her induced SCF also satisfies that it's non-dictatorial. Okay, so now we can answer Sen's question. Could the external observer find the information excluded by IIA useful? Yes, not she, that she might. She will certainly find it useful because her preferences induce an SCF satisfying universal domain, great efficiency and non-dictatorial. By Arrow's theorem, it must violate IIA. That is, Arrow's theorem proves that our ideally rational observer always uses information violating IIA to formulate her preferences. Okay, and we haven't assumed anything about her except that she's rational. So all rational observers uh, are going to violate IIA. <clears throat> so rather than satisfaction of IIA being a badge of rationality, it's evidence of irrationality. So I can't resist casting this in Shakespearean terms, IAA would be more honored in the breach than in the observance. Now you can say, look, the observer was just forced to treat all individuals symmetrically. That's far beyond anything that Arrow requires. That's a strong restriction. So yes, let's dispense with it. 
what was the purpose of that restriction? It was to get us past the possibility of dictatorship being a solution. We can't rule out um, uh, dictatorship by rationality. It could be that um, the observer believes that person 17 is God and therefore she should just be appointed dictator. Or maybe N equals five and it's five kindergarten kids and the fifth one is just hyper, hypersensitive. And maybe it's reasonable to, to just let her be a dictator for that reason. Okay, so we're gonna have to just split this, this into two cases. Case one, it's okay if your observer appoints a dictator. Then you're all set and Arrow's theorem is no obstacle. But the normal case we have in mind would be that a dictatorship would be entirely inappropriate. Okay, so if it's bad if your observer appoints a dictator, then you don't, if you don't let her violate IAA, bad things will happen. Either she appoints a dictator or she hurts everyone, that is, rejects strict Prado improvements. Okay, so with case two in, in mind as what we're normally concerned with, we could reinterpret Arrow's theorem. If you insist on throwing away critical ordinal information, bad things will happen. Okay, so I'm certainly not doing any new decision theory here. I'm not doing any new social choice uh, here. I'm just rereading Arrow's theorem. Um, uh, my old paper in 95 was called Arrow's theorem on its head. Okay, so I'm just, I'm just rereading the theorem, uh, not assuming anything about IAA being good or bad, but just uh, making sure that I have a, a rational observer and I find that she'll always violate IAA. Now I have a strange but very enthusiastic shout out here uh, to a paper that I have never read. Okay, it's by the distinguished uh, physicist, mathematical economist and social choice theorist Don Sari um, with uh, a Shakespearean ring to its title as well. Um, <clears throat> I saw this referred to in other papers and I've been unable to get my hands on it. It's not available online and the NYU library is locked down for the COVID epidemic. Uh, so I wrote to Don Sari and uh, he said, I'm going, I'm going off to a conference session. I'll, I'll look for it when I get back. Get back. <laughs> but he never got back to me. Um, so I've seen enough preview pages online to know that this has got really cool stuff in it uh, along the lines of saying in a completely different way that there is always good information in uh, that's, uh, that IIA is asking you to disregard. <clears throat> okay, so someday I look forward to reading that paper. Um, I hope you will too. Many, many other people, I'm just listing a few, have, have uh, questioned IA in different ways. Clifford Hildreth was perhaps the first of these, better known to the econometricians from Hildreth Liu. Um, I recommend Rothenberg's book, a really thoughtful book. Aki Leitinen uh, has a uh, uh, a paper which is more involved in the strategic issues, uh, but I love his title, A Farewell to IIA. I think it's high time, Aki. Um, Matthew Coakley has some, some nice ideas about measuring different strings and so on. I think Matthew will like uh, um, <clears throat> the Sari paper if he ever gets his hands on it as well. And the surprise entry on this list, Kenneth Arrow, as the decades went by, he got more and more friendly to the idea of um, actually relaxing IAA and in fact, relaxing positive restrictions, positive restrictions, so going beyond ordinal information altogether. Um, <clears throat> there are other arguments made for IAA, most frequently the dead candidate argument. Um, I think once you reread Arrow's theorem the way I'm suggesting, it's just a very unpersuasive arguments. So I've got a whole slide on it here and I'm just going to skip it in the interest of time. As the 1940s drew to a close, social choice was considered underdetermined. So Pareto efficiency left many possible candidate solutions and indeterminacy, which Bergson and Samuelson suggested could be resolved by a social welfare function. So initial resources, tastes and technology determine a possibility frontier and the social choice, a social welfare function ranks all the utility vectors. So you see the utility possibility frontier in black and a family of indifference curves from a, or level sets of a particular uh, Erickson Samuelson social welfare function in blue, inducing a solution A. But of course, you could have taken some other social welfare function and induced a solution B. So this ability to pick out almost any of the Pareto efficient points by different SWFs 
is what led Bergson and Samuelson and others to consider the philosophical problem underlying this basically underdetermined. With the publication of Arrow, by 1951, suddenly the so social choice problem was considered overdetermined. No solution could meet even minimal criteria. Samuelson's response to Arrow was that while the impossibility theorem was a brilliant achievement, it had nothing to do with welfare economics. Society faces only one profile of preferences, and so its welfare problem does not need to confront the multi-profile conditions, you and IIA of Arrow. Okay, so I've made up a goofy diagram here of this. So Arrow is starting at the black dot, okay? Uh, starting at on the left, nature or history or whatever is going to throw up some particular uh, preference profile of the end individuals. So I've labeled that row. So let's say that central black line uh, is what's been thrown up by history. Now we're at this blue dot or in a kind of sub game and uh, society has to decide, given Rho, how it wants to resolve the differences of opinions in Rho by ordering uh, social alternatives. Okay, so Samuelson insists on not starting at the black dot, but starting at the blue dot. He says, here we are, society has particular preferences, and the only problem we have to solve is what to do now. Okay, I don't care anything for your grand schemes starting with the black dot. But Arrow says, look, Whatever your ethical criterion is that you're applying at, at that blue dot, okay, as part of a general scheme, it is deeply flawed. It has to fail at least one of my axioms. Samuelson said, I don't care. <laughs> okay, so Samuelson's one profile in isolation stance was unpersuasive. To make matters worse, in the 1970s, some papers uh, introduced single profile axioms that produced impossibility results in the spirit of Arrow's theorem. Samuelson scored scorn, uh, poured scorn on these papers, but again failed to convince most readers. And those uh, two original lead papers were um, Kemp and Yu Kuang Ng in 76 and also Parks in 76. Uh, a short time later, there's some other beautiful papers, Kevin Roberts, Ariel Rubenstein, and more recently Feldman Serrano. So I recommend all of those to you and don't have time to get into them. But the loss of Samuelson's single profile refuge for justifying Berks and Samuelson was a further blow to Berks and Samuelson welfare economics. I quote again Florbaia and Mongin, the message got across to the non-specialists and it became part of the official history of economics that a major refutation had taken place. If the official death of welfare economics were to be dated with some precision, the years 76 through 79 would suggest themselves. Or generally, Amartya Sen writes that Arrow's theorem, quote, generated further pessimism in an already gloomy assessment of the possibility of a reasoned and satisfactory welfare economics. So he's writing that uh, in 2017 in his greatly expanded second uh, edition of his classic 1970 book, Collective Choice and Social Welfare. So why didn't Samuelson just say in 1950 that IIA was indefensible and therefore Arrow's theorem posed no problem for Brooks and Samuelson welfare theory? Had I been around then and as opinionated as I am now, I would have urged him to say exactly that. Uh, my theory for why he didn't, okay, is that IIA looked to Samuelson like the intellectual child of one of his own tenets, the meaninglessness of the further utility information. This, you recall, is ancient Greek village terminology. Okay, so discussing this in 1967, Samuelson combines two of the other axioms and he says, all three axioms seem reasonable. Arrow's great feat was to prove that no constitution function can satisfy them all. Which axioms should we reject? Listen to this. It is like asking which triplet one should put up for adoption. This is so close to home for Samuelson. Many people think that the IIA is the one that should go. I cannot agree. In the 1980s, Bergson and Samuelson offer at last a casual sketch of how to go from the description of an economy to uh, using a social, uh, a social welfare function uh, to pick a solution. So now they're beginning at the black dot, as it were, not at the blue dot. 
They're showing you how to start in any of these situations with different utilities and preferences and how to choose a solution. They're not saying that's the, the unique way to do it, but they're giving you an example. Okay, so now it's taking the, it's playing the role of a social choice function, an Erovian one. So it's gonna have to, to, to violate at least one of Arrow's conditions. Inevitably, it violates IIA. How absurd would it have looked if they'd chosen a Pareto-dominated point? That's antithetical to the whole idea of Brooks and Samuelson. Or if they just always given all the utility to one person. So, of course, it's going to violate IAA. Okay, so Samuelson, among all his gifts, was also a superb writer, just a gifted writer. And I want to read this next passage from him with you slowly. I don't know if it's intentional or not, but I just think it speaks so eloquent of his dissatisfaction with what he has to say. I must agree, he doesn't want to agree, I must agree with Bergson's contention that operationally we are explicitly and reasonably deciding to violate the axiom of independence of irrelevant alternatives. I love the next sentence. Third states of the world seem to force themselves legitimately. Okay, so for Samuelson, they're unexpected, they're unwelcome, but they can't be turned away. Okay, they seem to force themselves legitimately into our binary choices. Okay, it's desperate to explain how on earth this could have happened. He says, most ethical systems purport to define who is the deserving one by how the contemplated individuals react to a vast panoply of possible situations. You know, Brooks and Samuelson are not trying to divine the, the appropriate choice of the, the next Dalai Lama or something. They're trying to allocate some resources. So this is a very odd argument. It would almost be a better argument for Arrow being excused from opposing IAA than Brooks and Samuelson. So it really shouldn't have convinced anyone and it didn't. But again, gorgeous choice of words. Look at the title, Sparks from Arrows and Bull. Now, <clears throat> here's a quote from David Krebs. The reason I put this up is that when I speak to different colleagues about Arrows Theorem, IIA, logical positivism, they, most of them, the majority reaction is that David has clearly lost his mind. A small minority say, David, you're flogging a dead horse. Nobody has this old-fashioned interpretation of Arrow's theorem anymore, and IIA is thoroughly discredited. So I, that would be fine with me. I, it's not my view of surveying what I see in the profession. So I looked at um, uh, various modern texts, undergraduate ones, Mancu, for instance, I, uh, Maskell, uh, Winston Green, um, and to me, they look like uh, more like the old fashioned view, disturbing groups can't necessarily be as consistent as individuals and so on. Krebs says modern social choice theory begins and in some senses ends with a remarkable result, namely Arrow's theorem. So I certainly agree with him, it begins there. And I think unfortunately in many people's minds, it does essentially end there. They believe that Arrow has shown us that nothing can good, good or conclusive or sensible can come from this kind of abstract social welfare or social choice uh, exercise. And I don't think that's true because I, I don't interpret Arrow's theorem the, the way Arrow did. Um, but how about practitioners, specialists in, in uh, social choice? One of the most decorated of all is Eric Maskin. So in 2014, he's, he's noting that of course, no aggregation method that includes Arrow's four axioms can be satisfied all the time, but we can ask, quote, which rule satisfies them most often? In other words, if we can't achieve the ideal, which voting rule gets us closest to that ideal and maximizes the chance that the properties we want are satisfied? Okay, then Dasgupta and Maskin uh, come up with a very beautiful answer to that. But I don't think IAA is any kind of ideal. I think it's largely a misunderstanding and uh, it's it's not something I would want to impose. Uh, even if if one had reason to to think that there were very uh, uh, unproblematic uh, domain restrictions so that imposing IAA would not lead to non-existence, still I usually wouldn't want to impose it because it's informationally impoverishing. 
it may not be a good idea. Um, <clears throat> so I don't think I'm flogging a dead horse, <laughs> but enough of that. While there's broad agreement that welfare economics took a severe hit from the literature on, on impossibility theorems, from which it has never fully recovered. Fortunately, many leading researchers went right ahead and just did important work in the area anyway, either empirical or applied theory. So there are so many examples. Let me just choose uh, the, the British tradition. Think of Merleys, think of Tony Atkinson, think of Deaton and Moldbauer at the theoretical, theoretical end of things. Think of uh, Kevin Roberts and Peter Hammond, and also the Anglo-American partnerships, Deaton and Merleys, Atkinson, Stiglitz, and so on. So since then, countless scholars have, have made and continue to make uh, contributions in all sorts of modes of welfare economics, um, public, labor, IO, development, macro, and so on. But still, I feel there's something wrong. I, I feel uh, that we're in a, a suboptimal equilibrium. A large part of the profession, handicapped by their, what I consider their, their ill-advised traditional <laughs> interpretation of Arrow's theorem, takes adventurous applied welfare economics less seriously than I think it should, at the same time disregarding theoretical work that goes beyond narrow positivism. Okay, so everyone loses, I think. What do I mean uh, adventurous applied welfare economics? I really just mean um, going beyond what Samuelson cleverly called, um, uh, I have to remember her name, uh, Gertrude Stein. So the Gertrude Stein metric in welfare economics is, uh, a dollar is a dollar is a dollar. So work that goes beyond that. Um, okay, so I've been restricting attention to, to the Arrow's world where only ordinal information is, is uh, available, but to satisfy the curiosity of those ancient Greek villagers, let's spend a moment on the further utility information. This comes in two forms, the welfare of one individual or welfare comparisons across individuals. The first is subtle and confusing. The second one is way worse. Okay, so let's start with the first. So first, what do we even mean by cardinal information? Arrow has some helpful thoughts about that. Arrow says, the problem of measuring utility has frequently been compared with the problem of measuring temperature. This comparison is very apt. Operationally, the temperature of a body is the volume of a unit mass of a perfect gas placed in contact with it. Why, might it be asked, was not the logarithm of the volume, or perhaps the cube root of the volume of the gas used instead? The reason is simply that the general gas equation assumes a particularly simple form when temperature is defined in the way indicated, but there is no deeper significance. Okay, so he's pointing out that, that uh, cardinality is, is partly in the eye of the beholder. It does something seem really natural? Is it natural to regard a particular way to measure a thing as the, the correct way, okay? So uh, his purpose here is to say that um, neither temperature nor, nor uh, experienced utility is, is really particularly cardinal. He also offers this as a reason for not considering utility measurable. But is temperature not measurable? What else are thermometers for? So I want to go into this a little bit further. So compare two situations. Situation one. Suppose you teach a class on expected utility theory, and you then assign a problem to the class where an individual with a particular phenomenon or concern utility function has to choose how much insurance to buy. A student emails you that evening asking, the utility function you gave us is one of many equivalent ones, you said, but which scale is being used here? For this representation, what is 50 utils, for example? And you write back, it doesn't matter. You don't need any information of that kind. You make a note that the student may need some extra help. Situation two, you wake up and say, Siri, I'm in zip code 10012. What's the outdoor temperature? Siri says, I know where you are. The temperature is 30. You, is that 30 degrees Fahrenheit? Siri, possibly, or Celsius. The scales are equivalent. I no longer record that distinction. You realize with horror that Siri has been scanning the economics literature. So we see the temperature is A, measurable, B, less than cardinal, as per Arrow's quote, okay, but in a different sense, more than cardinal, it has absolute meaning, and Siri, not being human, has not understood that. <clears throat> so 30 degrees Fahrenheit 
uh, is a particular thing uh, more than, okay, you don't need to compare it to other temperatures for it to mean something. 30 degrees Fahrenheit uh, is, has, has absolute meaning. Water will freeze at 30 degrees. Vodka will not freeze at 30 degrees. Okay, so that's a sense in which we're, uh, we're going far beyond uh, the information conveyed in any classroom utility. Classroom utility is virtually always either ordinal or cardinal, and it's never going to tell you anything absolute. You never learn if this person buying insurance is happy or miserable. Okay, it's not considered to mean anything. So I'm pointing out the classroom utility is quite different from temperature, even though Arrow is saying that the comparison is apt. And now I want to talk about what I care about more, actual utility. Okay, so right away you say, okay, what on earth is he talking about now? <clears throat> we don't have that in economics. And isn't it interesting that we don't? It's an offense to, to positivist uh, <laughs> economics. So that's why we don't have it. Okay, so I'm going to have to explain what would I mean by it. So the best I can do, I guess, is that it's a one-dimensional collapse onto the real numbers of uh, different experiences ranked by the individual's preference ordering or his tastes more generally. Okay, so let me give you an example. So suppose I make a whole bunch of decisions and the government makes a whole bunch of decisions, my, my tax rate, and maybe they build a bridge in, in my neighborhood rather than an amusement park. Okay, so given all those decisions, my life is a certain way. And uh, that's very complex, multidimensional. Um, but, um, you know, one could have had a different set of decisions and my life would be a different way. Maybe I like the, the first outcome better. Maybe I call it 80 utils. I don't care how we label it for the moment. Maybe the other one I call it 71 utils. But by 80, I mean not just something that's better than that other thing, but it has an absolute reality, at least introspectively. The way my life is then is a particular way. Okay, and my sufficient statistic for that is 80. Okay, so this kind of utility is, is it measurable? Well, certainly not as clearly as temperature is measurable. Is it less than cardinal? I have things to say about that, but I don't think I have much time, so let's uh, skip that. And I just want to say it's more than cardinal. Yes, just as temperature is more than cardinal, it has an absolute meaning. Okay, so in the absence of what uh, Edgeworth called a uh, hedonometer in 1881, how might we measure utility? So lots of different ways we could try. They're all highly imperfect. So we could ask, there's a big industry of happiness surveys. Um, you could think about minimal sensible differences. You could think about choice under risk or choice across time as trying to tease out marginal utilities. So there are going to be references on the next slide for the first, second, and fourth of these. So the first about asking, um, these are just a few of, of maybe a couple of hundred references. The second one is interesting. It's the Frisch Memorial Lecture by McFadden in 2005 to this body. Um, <clears throat> there's a, a kind of uh, against the flow of the literature, um, Betsy Stevenson and Justin Wolfer's uh, paper there as well. Um, how about minimal sensible differences? Um, Goodman and Markowitz uh, in the 50s, uh, Yu Kuang Ng has a fine paper on this in the 70s, and I see I've left off my favor favorite reference on this uh, from the slide, but I remember it. It's, I think, in the Economic Journal, maybe 2019. It's by uh, Rosella Argenciano and Saki Gilboa. Okay, so please take a look at that. And finally, the um, intertemporal approach. Interestingly, Samuelson initiated that um, in 1937. He must have been in a very permissive mood. And, um, and there is a job market paper, a very sophisticated paper, um, uh, See, Lauren from Northwestern, I think is going to be a, an Oxford postdoc next year. So uh, really interesting uh, intertemporal modeling of utility and, and utilitarianism. Uh, now, the other category that I mentioned, which I didn't give uh, references for, was uh, using attitudes to risk to try to infer something about the shape of an experienced utility function. Um, <clears throat> So Arrow and, and many others stepped up to say that uh, information related to behavior under risk has no relevance for welfare economics. So for instance, an expected utility representation. That's not my view. I don't think uh, 
Bikri thought so either, or Harsani, but I think uh, my view is a very, very uh, minority view. Um, but as Krebs says in 2013, in consumer theory, we don't usually expect separability across commodities. One sees substitutes and complements everywhere. But as states of the world are mutually exclusive, independence axioms there seem rather natural. Okay, so I do not want to implicate Krebs in the rest of what I'm going to say at all. I don't know what he would say. But to me, that same idea suggests that a given sacrifice in state two, for example, could be used to calibrate marginal utilities at different levels of money price, for example, in state one. Because consumption in, in one state doesn't, quote unquote, cast a shadow on consumption in another state, as consumption in state one rises, that given sacrifice in state two can be viewed as something of a constant external sacrifice, like a measuring stick. Okay, so you might be able to find successive utility interval, intervals, each of which seems to be equally important to this decision maker. And I would be interested in that uh, if I were a sympathetic observer allocating resources. Watcha Sen has been a huge champion of bringing information to bear on social choice problems. Working with a social welfare functional that takes as inputs n utility functions rather than just n preference orders, Sen expresses the amount of information those utility functions are supposed to be carrying or conveying by specifying what is the admissible set of transformations that leave one in the same informational equivalence class. Okay, so this is akin to what we tell our students about increasing transformations of ordinal utility versus increasing affine transformations of cardinal utility. So this allows uh, all kinds of, of different categories of, of um, cardinality and comparability. Uh, I, I offer one uh, <clears throat> example here, but I don't think we have time for it. I'm going to move on. Poco, poco, accelerando. My impression is that although this invariance transforms approach is quite rich, it still has limitations. For example, suppose for some person we have ideal information, so far beyond ordinal or cardinal utility, uh, his utility function conveys exact information about his degree of satisfaction. So no transformations of this function are allowed. Okay, the literature calls this perfect measurability of this person I. Now suppose we happen to have this for all n of the individuals in society. Does that mean we also automatically have interpersonal comparability? I don't believe so. The literature says we do. Okay, so the standard treatment in the literature, and for this I refer to you to a really fine uh, survey paper <clears throat> by Bossert and Waymark. It's in the second volume of the Handbook of Utility, and it's chapter 20. Uh, so if you look at page 1,122 <laughs> of that handbook, you'll see what I mean. Um, <clears throat> while you're at it, look at chapter 21 as well. Really excellent complementary survey by uh, Frobey and Peter Hammond. Um, okay, so I'm saying that even though you have perfect measurability, that doesn't necessarily mean you have uh, comparability in, in my book. Okay, so for those who are unpersuaded, I want to offer an example just to, to, to stretch your faith a little bit. So suppose there are only two members of society. Here's the first. So a lot of you are thinking, oh, this is Anne of Anne and Bob. Okay, and the behavioral crowd are thinking, no, no, it's, it's Linda, the feminist bank teller. So reasonable guesses, but no, this is Jane. Jane is highly intelligent, she's deeply musical, and she loves animals. The second member of society is Jane's pet Dalmatian, Spot. There's Spot. Deeply intelligent, mm, even by canine standards, maybe not so much, but he's such a good boy. Um, he loves food, he likes humans, he likes other dogs, and it's fun to chase squirrels. Okay, so normally we don't think that we understand exactly what it's like to be Jane, much less exactly what it's like to be Spot. He's so cognitively remote. But suppose we're far in the future and we have some simulator program that lets us uh, find out what it's like exactly to be Jane and exactly what it's like to be Spot. Okay, so we have, in other words, perfect measurability. Okay, does that mean that uh, these two agents, Jane and Spot, are perfectly comparable? Does it mean that we can say is Spot 
happier than Jane or sadder than Jane? And it, does it mean that any individual uh, would, would agree with any other about whether they'd like to be Jane or whether they'd like to be Spot? Would Spot agree with that choice? This really uh, stretches the Harsanyi <laughs> doctrine perhaps to its very limits. Um, <clears throat> I would say no. I mean, Jane never gets as, as hysterically excited as Spot does when he's about to be fed his, his favorite dinner. He goes racing around the apartment, not accidentally knocking everything over. On the other hand, he never experienced the, experiences the transcendental feeling that Jane gets when she listens to her favorite Bach, Brandenburg Concerto. So I'm willing to say that um, even if we understand each of these perfectly, it's not clear uh, what a Rawlsian solution would mean, for example. Uh, <clears throat> so what I'm telling the specialists in this literature is, um, I love what you're telling me, but I want you to tell me even more, an even richer language. Okay, I've been very critical of how uh, traditional welfare economics and, um, and social choice are done. Uh, so how do I think they should be done? The um, famous novelist uh, Somerset Mom was sometimes asked for tips on writing a novel. And you know, what he used to say was, there are three rules for writing a novel. Unfortunately, no one knows what they are. So I don't think social choice is any easier than writing a great novel. Perhaps its greatest challenge is that individual welfare is not immediately observable. Okay, that's. Uh, major problem. I'm not qualified to give advice in this field, but I can articulate a few personal requests, some for the profession and some for the specialists. First, please say farewell to meaninglessness. When you're dealing with welfare, meaninglessness will mess you up. It has messed us up for 80 years. Let's not try to extend that to 100 years of solipsism. Secondly, say farewell to IIA. I think IIA was born of a misunderstanding from misapplying uh, rigid positivism to welfare. I think um, except in, in certain special cases, we're, we're really better off without it. Thirdly, let's say farewell to certainty. I have to explain here what I mean. The 1950 views of information about utility and welfare, uh, <clears throat> that view was that there um, are two categories. Category one, information you get from revealed preference. Category two, meaninglessness that should be discarded, thrown to the dustbin. Okay, so I want to say, let's not throw all of that to the dustbin. Some of that is good stuff. Let's try to examine it, study it, uh, disentangle it, rehabilitate it, and try to learn what we can about it. But let's not pretend that we're ever going to know as much about it as we do about the revealed preference evidence. Okay, so some of the adventurous theoretical social choice literature uh, says, okay, if we had only ordinal information, these are the possibilities. If instead we had this particular kind of cardinality and this particular kind of comparability, then here's what we can do. But finally, we have to face the fact that we're not going to have that kind of information. It's not like we have it or we don't. We're going to have a sewn together, patchy guesswork stuff, uh, which is the best that we can come up with. And we're going to do it anyway, because it's so important. Okay, so this is closely related to my fourth and final request. Please develop a language. So develop a language to talk about this set second category of information which because it was banned by positivism, we've never uh, developed a consistent agreed upon language to discuss. So in the absence of such a language today, I have had to, um, I've had to resort to thermometers, Dalmatians, Siri, ancient Greek villagers to try to conjure up uh, the kinds of ideas that we really preferably should have a language for. Okay, so this is a really difficult problem. It's easy for me to say, let's develop a language. But what we're talking about is 
We're trying to develop a shared understanding for something where we never have fully shared data. So we have experiences together, we go to a concert, we go to dinner or whatever, but you never experienced my introspective take on that and I never experienced yours. Okay, so it's, a, it's an amazing epistemic challenge to try to, to share information where you know that you're probably being misunderstood and the other person knows they're probably under, misunderstanding you. Uh, it's it's uh, very related to the idea of how do I know that I see blue the way you see blue. Um, <clears throat> when I was a graduate student, somehow I got the idea that the British philosopher uh, Barclay was the first to formally investigate this. But no, in fact, guess who talked about it already? Yorgias, <laughs> okay, the, the early sophist. So again, thanks to Sextus Empiricus, we know that he wrote uh, a sentence, something like, um, how can words can convey, how can words convey ideas of color when the ear does not hear colors, but only sounds? Beautiful and, <laughs> and quite a devastating question. And that's the kind of thing that, that we're facing here in trying to develop this language. Um, Frank Knight said, values are established or validated or recognized through discussion. Uh, so we so far don't really have an adequate language to hold that discussion. And I would love to think that future Joan Robinsons and future Paul Samuelsons could debate not just capital theory and reswitching, but also policy and welfare analysis with as robust a language as we can develop for them to use. Um, <clears throat> this seems to be in the unholy interface of epistemics, linguistics, psychology, and maybe we're going to get a little help eventually, gradually from uh, neuroeconomics, neuroscience. Um, I hope there are some uh, people sufficiently brilliant and brave to take on this, this task on behalf of, of all of us. I want to go back, I want to end by going back for a moment to Ragnar Frisch. What would he think of all this discussion? I'm not confident he would agree with much of what I said, but I think at least he would be very happy with uh, the fact that we were spending time thinking about human welfare. I took a look at his Nobel Prize acceptance lecture, and there he's as expansive as ever, discussing not just econometrics, but antimatter, metagalaxies, chaos, evolution, and even our influence on evolution. So reading that gives you a clear idea of the, the scope of his conception of economics. I want to extract one quote from that speech um, <clears throat> because I think it gives you a taste of the humanity of that conception. Understanding is not enough. You must have compassion. I cannot be happy if I can't believe that in the end, the results of our endeavors may be utilized in some way for the betterment of the little man's fate. Ragnar Frisch, 1969. Thank you.